sa salita ng Diyos upang mahukay ang mga kayamanan ng mga katotohanan na inihahayag sa ating panahon. Comparing spiritual with spiritual. Lunes hanggang biyernes, alas 9 hanggang alas 10 ng gabi. Dito pa rin sa DZME. 15.30, una sa kanan, ang himpilang may paninindigan. Ang mundo ay isinumpa, ngunit patuloy pa rin pinapakain ni Kristo ang kanyang mga tupa at maririnig ng kanyang mga tupa ang kanyang boses na siyang katotohanan ng salita ng Diyos. Ang Biblia, comparing spiritual with spiritual. Welcome to E-Bible Fellowship. E-Bible Fellowship is a ministry that is completely focused on the Bible. The Bible is the supreme authority and the book of truth. The Bible is also its own interpreter, and God uses it to guide His elect people into the understanding of truth. We hope the Lord will bless you as you listen to our Bible-centered programming. Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now with your Evening Bible Study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Genesis. Tonight, is study number 27 of Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 18 through 20. Genesis 6 verse 18 says, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing of all flesh, too, of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark. To keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth, after his kind, too, of every sort shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. And I'll stop reading there. Now in uh, verse 18, we've already gone over it. We saw that the covenant is the word of God, the Bible, and, and God makes a covenant with his people through his word, whether it be Noah or Abraham or Jacob or whoever. It's the same covenant, and it's the same word of God with each one. And then God foretold 120 years in advance exactly who would enter into the ark. It would be Noah, his wife, his three sons, or he says his sons and their wives. And, and, and that's it. The Lord did not specify or make reference to any other person, but Noah and his immediate family. And we, we know in the next chapter, when the flood uh, takes place, 120 years Later, that it is exactly those same people, eight souls that enter into the ark. And we discussed in our last study how that fits in with God's program of predestination. That before the foundation of the world, he named the people that would be saved and their sins were laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and as time has unfolded, as the history of the world has taken place, God has found those people and those people only to save and to deliver from his wrath. And, and they were brought into the kingdom or uh, into the Lord Jesus Christ and hid from the wrath of God through God's salvation program. 
So God's naming of the people to enter the ark is a figure of his overall salvation plan of election wherein he names each individual that will become saved. All right, let, let's go on to verse uh, 19 and verse 20. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. In verses 19 and 20, the Lord makes reference to the animal world and his deliverance of the animals. They are to be brought into the ark. Again, here God is foretelling because the ark has not yet been built. The rain has not yet begun to fall. That's decades away, over a century away. But just as he named the people who would enter in, in these two verses, he tells us of the animals that will enter in and the number of the animals, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark. And he repeats it in verse 20, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And, and so again, just as with the people, the Noah and his family are a picture of God's salvation, his election program, the animals also typify the same thing. They are types and figures of all that God will save, his elect. And we know from several verses in the Bible that the Lord refers to animals in similar ways to people. For instance, in Jonah chapter 3, after Jonah has gone into the city a day's journey and proclaimed yet 40 days, it says in Jonah 3, beginning in verse 7, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. And you, you can't distinguish, you can't separate what God is saying of man and, and what he's saying of the beast. Both were not to eat. Both were not to drink. Both man and beast were to be covered with sackcloth. And the way verse 8 is worded, again, I'll read it, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. It's almost as if God is indicating the beast will cry mightily unto him along with man. And, of course, that didn't happen. Men cried. Men besought the Lord, the men of Nineveh, that he might have mercy, and not the beasts. But the picture is that the animals are in the same predicament, the same trouble as the man, and everything the man does, the animals to do also. Because God typifies men as animals. And we're going to look at, at just a few verses. Let's go to Numbers 22. And this is the account of Balaam and his donkey. We're breaking into the historical story at the point where the donkey has disobeyed his master Balaam. And it says in Numbers 22 verse 32, and the angel of Jehovah said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. There 
the Lord is speaking directly to Balaam. And then in verse 33, And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. And this is, of course, one of those amazing Bible stories. It's a true historical account of God opening up the mouth of an animal, uh, Balaam's ass, and, and not only the mouth, but the eyes of the animal, so that the donkey saw the angel of Jehovah, who is God himself, standing in the way against Balaam with, with a sword to slay him. And the donkey turned aside three times. It refused to go, and Balaam smote his ass. And, and so God points out that the ass saved Balaam's life, and if she had not turned, he would have slain Balaam and saved her alive. And there we see very clearly that the animal, the donkey, typifies someone God has saved. He opens up her mouth. He says, I, I saved her alive. And Balaam typifies the unsaved. The, the man in the story is a representation of an unsaved person, while the donkey is a representation of the saved. God used the animal to picture someone he saved. It's similar to Exodus 13. In verse 13, the Lord gave this law. He says, In every firstling of an ass, thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. Now this this scripture has all sorts of um, a gospel meaning. To redeem with a lamb, of course, points to the redemption that the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, obtained for his people. And, and so with this law, every firstborn man was to be redeemed. And every firstling of an ass was likewise to be redeemed with a lamb. As a matter of fact, if it were not redeemed, then it was to have its neck broken to uh, signify it's under the wrath of God. When people break their neck like Eli, uh, at, uh, when he fell back, he broke his neck because it was a picture of him being under the wrath of God, both the falling backwards and the breaking of the neck pictures an individual that is under the wrath of God. And the ass was also to be counted under the wrath of God if it were not redeemed by a lamb. And, and so again, God there is using animals to picture his uh, salvation program. In Isaiah 53, the Lord says this, in this Messianic chapter of the book of Isaiah, in verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and Jehovah hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And, and here and in many other places, God typifies his people as sheep. Uh, we are the sheep of his pasture. He, he is our shepherd. And, and there is much biblical language that goes along those lines. And, and yet, uh, sometimes we don't stop and think, well, well uh, in doing that, God is picturing his people as animals, as sheep. Sheep that feed upon grass and lie by still waters and so forth. And yet, uh, a sheep is an animal. 
uh, remember in the New Testament, there was a woman who was beseeching the Lord to help her and heal her daughter. But the Lord Jesus said he was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there's another reference to sheep. And yet the woman came and worshipped him and said in verse 25, uh, Lord, help me. And then in verse 26, but he answered and said, it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And here the woman was, was identifying herself with a dog waiting for a crumb to fall from the table. And, and there's other instances in the Bible where God is speaking of people. He's speaking of his elect, but he is using the figure of animals. And that's what's going on here. In Genesis 6, in verses 19 and 20, And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. It's repeated that that phrase, keep them alive, twice, once in verse 19, once in verse 20. Also, of course, the people that went on board the ark were kept alive. It relates to Psalm 41, this language of being kept alive. Psalm 41, verse 1 says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. Jehovah will deliver him in time of trouble. Jehovah will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The poor, as well as strangers and widows in the Bible, typify God's people. And, and so here uh, Jehovah considers the poor and will deliver him and preserve him and keep him alive. All those that were kept alive in the ark are a picture of the spiritually poor, the poor in spirit, and, and all God's people, the people as well as the animals. And they're kept alive through the construction of the ark. It, it was a craft designed by God, built for the salvation of uh, Noah, his family, and all the animals. Yes, the Lord um, wanted to deliver the animals to keep the species of dog and species of sheep and goat and birds and ravens and doves and so forth alive on the earth. But, but deeper than that, all the animals that were had their lives preserved found deliverance, uh, the same as Noah and his family, and were spared from dying in the flood as, as all the rest of the animals were. Uh, this is only um, a handful out of the whole. It's a remnant of the animals, isn't it? There were male and female animals sheep and, and, and male and female, this kind of animal, and that kind of animal, two, and, and some others, there were seven. But, but overall, the total number of animals that found refuge on the ark were nothing in comparison to the great number of animals outside the ark all over the rest of the world. How, how many sheep were there? We don't know. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. We, we don't know how many dogs and how many cats and how many elephants and, 
and how many mice and, and other rodents there were and rabbits and there could have been tremendous numbers of animals that populated the earth and yet God spared a remnant of them. He took in a remnant and God had to work in order to do it. Well, we'll, we'll save that discussion for the next chapter when the animals begin to arrive at the ark at the time that the ark was completed and God was about to bring the flood. You know, Noah wasn't running around trapping and, and, and uh, catching all these animals. That would have been impossible. Uh, maybe, yeah, he could have caught some, but, but of every species that God intended, no, they, it, it was not possible for him to do that. And it would have taken, even if he had tried, a tremendous amount of time for him to capture and, and, and to um, keep penned up somewhere all these animals in anticipation of loading them on the ark. And none of that was necessary because God moved in the animals to come to the ark. It, in other words, God drew them just like he draws people. As, as the Lord Jesus said in John 6, in verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And, and God drew the animals. He led them there. He, he had them wait in line, um, for all we know, as they boarded the ark. You know, we were not presented with a picture of chaos that uh, Noah and his sons and, and, and their wives had to chase animals around like chickens and, and grab a hold of them and, and somehow get them into the ark. But the way the Bible presents it is very orderly. The animals got on board because God directed them there. God, who created them, worked in, in them, had all the necessary types of animals arrive at the proper time and they boarded according to God's timetable and and they were all on board no one his family were all on board then God shut the door none of the predestinated people predestinated by God were left out none of the called animals and called and drawn by God were left outside. But there were the male and female of each animal species. And so God is again painting a picture of saving a remnant of a whole. Just, just as he, his overall salvation program, he saves a remnant of people, yet there's billions left unsaved. He saved a remnant of animals, delivering them from the death of the flood. And yet millions upon millions of other animals died in the flood. And we're still benefiting from that with fossil fuels today. But, but this is the picture that God is given. And they were kept alive. Now this ties in with the statements of First Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 15 and 17, where the Lord speaks of the coming of Christ, the second coming at the time of the end. And he says in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He repeats it in verse 17. Then we which are alive and and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. They were loaded onto the ark and kept alive. Noah and the other seven human beings were kept alive through the ark. They were alive and remained. Of all the rest of the people in the world, none of the rest were alive, none of the rest remained. But 
but they did, and so too is God picking up on that figure, which we could actually expect because the Lord began Judgment Day, May 21, 2011, on a day that identified 7,000 years from the point of his shutting the door of the ark and the beginning of the flood. And, and therefore, it identified with the keeping in or the, the shutting of the door was not only a judgment upon those without, but it was a necessary safety uh, mechanism to protect all within so that they could be kept alive and remain for when the flood would be over and then they would come out. So God uses the language that we find concerning those that were uh, brought into the ark. They were kept alive. They, their, their lives were preserved. And all of God's people, all the elect, save prior to the shutting of the door on May 21, 2011, are alive, and as long as they, they continue to live physically, and remain upon the earth and will do so until God takes them in physical death and then their spirit would go to be with the Lord, or if they remain until the very end, they will be um, what this group of people in 1 Thessalonians 4 is referring to, those that were alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Well, the Lord does not keep alive the wicked. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 20, in verse 16, But of the cities of these people, which Jehovah thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as Jehovah thy God has commanded thee. None of the wicked are kept alive. In Job 36, verse 6, it says, He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. It is not God's purpose to preserve the life of the wicked. And, and, and so, when he brings judgment, he slays the wicked. The, the walls of Jericho fall down and he kills everyone but Rahab, the harlot, and her family because he made obligation to her. She is a picture of his elect. But all the rest of the people of the city, man, woman, and child, are slain by the sword. They're killed. And that's how it was with the flood. All who found grace in God's sight along with Noah and, and all the animals that were delivered, they're kept alive because of God's will. And, and this is all according to his purpose and his good pleasure. And the rest of mankind and the rest of all the animals that are in the world that have the breath of life are destroyed. God um, does not preserve their lives. They, they had no provision made for them. The ark was constructed for the people and the animals that God brought on board. There was none provision made for anyone else. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over Pal Talk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.
Hi, this is Harry Dysart with eBible Fellowship. Thanks for joining us for the Psalm of the Day. As our Lord says in His Word in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 50 A Psalm of Asaph The mighty God, even Jehovah, hath spoken, and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty God hath shined. Our God shall come, and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above, and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For God is judge himself, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices, or thy burnt offerings, to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he-goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest, and speakest against thy brother, 
thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. As our Lord instructs us, we read in Psalm 47, verses 6 and 7, Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. Please join us again for the Psalm of the Day. May God's Word be praised. My guide and stay can be Through cloud and sunshine Lord, abide with me The wicked perish And destruction find Even their thoughts shall Thou thy cross, 
Greetings, everyone. This is Bob Grandy welcoming you to eBible Fellowship's program called Where's That Bible Verse? God tells us in Romans 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. During this time, I'll slowly read and then repeat five random verses from the King James Bible, but I will not tell you where they are located in God's Word, the Bible. So listen carefully and try to identify which Bible book, chapter, and even the verse number where each verse can be found. Here's the first verse. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently, but if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. I'll read it again. For what glory is it if, when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Here's the second verse. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. I'll read it again. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Here's the third verse. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. I'll repeat it. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. Here's the fourth verse today. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Here it is again. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And here's our fifth and final verse today. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Jehovah cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Here it is again. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of Jehovah cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Okay, we'll be back in a moment to discover where these scriptures are located in God's Word, the Bible. Let's find out where today's verses are found in the Bible. Here's the first verse. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? 
But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. We can find that verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. 1 Peter 2, 20. And the second verse, After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. That verse is found in the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 2. Hosea 6, verse 2. And the third verse is, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. That verse is found in 2 John, verse 10. 2 John, verse 10. And the fourth verse today is, Many shall be purified, and made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. That is found in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 10. Daniel 12, verse 10. And the fifth verse today is, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Jehovah cometh, for it is nigh at hand. That verse is found in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 1. Joel, chapter 2, verse 1. Thank you for joining us today to discover Where's That Bible Verse? And remember what God tells us in Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. his name I'm fixed upon it name of thy redeeming love here I raise my Ebenezer hither by thy help I'm come and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood Oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love oh my heart he took and sealed it sealed it for his courts above oh that day when freed from sinning i shall see thy lovely face clothed then in the blood washed linen how i'll sing thy wondrous grace come my lord Swift to carry me to
Welcome to the audio reading of 50 Types and Figures Found in the Bible on eBible Fellowship. Moving on in our 50 Types and Figures Found in the Bible, we'll learn about the house and the temple. In the scriptures, we read quite a bit about the preparation or the construction, and finally, the worship of the house of God. This was a glorious temple first built in the days of Solomon. King David long made preparations for its building, and enormous expense went into its construction upon the death of David and during the reign of his son Solomon. The temple was outwardly magnificent, and all were impressed with its splendor, but few were aware that in all of its elaborate decorations and costly array, It was all put together by the Lord to paint another picture of the Bible's truth. In other words, the temple was a historical type and figure of an actual building designed to illustrate a truth, just as Christ's parables were words designed to illustrate various truths of God's gospel plan. And after Solomon completed the building of the temple, we read in 1 Kings 8, verse 12, Then spake Solomon, the Lord said, that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee an house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in for ever. The house that Solomon built was a physical earthly construction, and there was no way that house would continue for ever. As a matter of fact, when the Babylonians entered into Jerusalem, which was in the year 587 B.C., they destroyed the temple, so it was certainly not an eternal dwelling place. It can be proven from the Bible that the physical temple was destroyed, and yet God spoke here of it being a house for him to dwell in forever. It was far from forever. It was just a matter of a few hundred years until that house was destroyed. Well, since we know that God cannot lie or make a mistake, he couldn't have been speaking of that physical house because he knew that house would be destroyed. But he's using this language in order to paint a picture. The eternal habitation of God would not take place in a physical temple, but it does occur in the spiritual temple. What did the temple represent? Well, we can discover the answer to that question as we search the Bible for clues. And we find some help in 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 16. Let's read that. And what agreement hath the temple of God with us? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It says there in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, that the elect believers are the temple of the living God. We see some further support for this truth in this scripture in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? And we also read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. From these verses we learn that spiritually the Lord views those he saved as being part of his house or temple. Therefore, we also understand that the Bible likens God's salvation plan to the construction of the spiritual house of God. And once all of those to be saved, who are the elect, have become saved, the house is then completed and ready for the Spirit of God to enter in and dwell forevermore. While describing the specific details of the construction of the temple in Solomon's day, we read in 1 Kings 6, verse 7, And the house, when it was in building, 
was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. It's very interesting that God gives us this information that the stones were made ready before being brought to the temple, and that indicates that there was no hammering or cutting done inside. This is a picture of the fact that the elect did not do any work for their salvation. Instead, all the work had been done by the Lord Jesus, who made payment for sins from the foundation of the world. So the temple is a type and a figure of the body of elect true believers. We thank you for joining us for this audio reading of 50 Types and Figures Found in the Bible here on eBible Fellowship. Thank you for spending time with us and God's holy word, the Bible. If you'd like to learn more about eBible Fellowship, please visit our website at ebiblefellowship.org. Thank you and may God's perfect will be done.